it may be a long time before humankind can find life on Mars. But one thing we do know is the time is coming when astronauts will stand on its surface. Let me take you on a journey to the future. Humans have finally landed on Mars and want to stay, but where? Should the design of a Mars habitat be merely functional? Or is it vital to the sanity of the Martians to have touches from home? What do you do on a planet with few materials when the nearest store is millions of kilometres away? The moment you put a human in a space station, then you need a designer, because that's what we do. Designers and architects, they design for humans, for human environments, and engineers are kind of ill-equipped to do that, I think. In the 1960s, the same thing dawned on NASA. Spacecraft such as Skylab needed to be more human-friendly. So they hired designer Raymond Lowy, who introduced colour and a table for astronauts. So you might think, well, it's a table. What's interesting about that? When the original design, the astronauts would just have a little flap that comes out of the wall where they could have their meals on, and they weren't even located together. They were just in other parts of the station. And you were thinking like, well, what about humans having a conversation over a meal? See how that day was. Second thing he did, and it's quite astonishing, he put a window in Skylab. Because in the original Skylab, the engineers did not put a window in. Because they thought, well, it's more risk. But imagine going around the Earth for weeks or months and not seeing an amazing view of Earth. That is just beyond my belief. It's this story that encouraged and inspired architect Xavier de Castellia to enter NASA's 3D printed habitat competition, run over several years, to bring fresh ideas to the construction technology needed for sustainable living on the Moon and Mars. So this is where all the design work happens. Ah uh, yes, you can definitely tell this is an architect's office. Just the a couple drawings, of plans. Walls, <laughs> models everywhere, books everywhere. <laughs> I don't know. know how you've got time to design for Mars. You've got to deal with it. So this is a big screen that we used to collaborate with. We'll kind of explain the whole project. The drawing on the left is what we call the mission architecture. And on the right is the architecture. Astronauts will live and work in lightweight inflatable pods prefabricated on Earth, which will be able to mitigate the pressure differences. One of the questions we often get asked, like, why is it the shape it is? Because it wasn't a circle in the beginning. In the beginning, we had this. We had like a star-shaped plan. Okay. I had conversations with NASA about this, and one of the concerns they had was, what if there's a failure in this middle bit? Imagine you're here, oh, yeah. and you're, the other astronaut is here, and the other one is here, and there's a failure in this connection pod. Then you cut off. They cut off. They can't get to anywhere, right? So, massive disaster. So, what we've done... <laughs> a disaster to start with. Absolute <laughs> disaster. So, what we've done, we've redesigned it as a torus, as a circle. Uh -huh. Which means, imagine something happens in this pod. There's a catastrophic failure. This pod cannot be used anymore. Any place the other astronauts are in, they can connect still through. So, that's one of the reasons why it is the shape it is. Mm -hmm. So, we have a whole bunch of pods connected by these connection models. They do a couple of things. They first of all connect two pods, two spaces, mm -hmm. and they have a third exit, and that can then become either a connection to the rover or a connection to a suit port. And the suit port is interesting. <laughs> it's kind of funny, like the suit just hangs from the outside. Yeah. The reason for that is that you, if you have a suit and you go inside the space and get changed, mm. you bring in dust from the outside, right. right? With this one, you just kind of open the hatch, mm. crawl in your suit, mm. lock it off, and off you go. So the suit always stays on the outside. The pods and the astronauts would not be able to withstand the radiation beating down. So Xavier came up with a futuristic solution, a shell structure built by small autonomous robots. Sent before the humans, they will 3D print the shell over several months. They work like ants, first digging up the Martian regolith or dirt. They then process it down, melt it and print it layer by layer. 
So you can't bring in wood and bricks and all that stuff? We're not going to bring cement heavy. or concrete, so anything like that. No. We're using what we've got. So in an interesting way, it's super sustainable. You use the local materials to build with. So the robotic system we designed is modular. It's actually one part connects to the other part and can create different types of robots. And that's important because once we've done digging or we've done printing, we can readjust it and make a different type of robot. But hang on, have you actually made a robot like this? Or is I haven't this, done it yet. This is, yeah. this is in the future. <laughs> this is indeed the concept, yeah. right? Um, and it's kind of interesting. So we talk to a lot of uh, mechanical engineers, robotics engineers, mm. and often they go, well, you know, you're a one-wheel robot. That might not be very feasible. <laughs> but, they, but they always go like, yeah, but the, the idea of having autonomous, readjustable uh, robots and modular robots, that's a kind of an interesting idea. So we've put some funding out and hopefully we're going to start building some of these soon. If half of them break or half of them don't even arrive on Mars, that's fine. We can still build the shell structure, it might just take a little bit longer. It may seem like a sci-fi dream, but this design is underpinned by science gathered at a symposium. So we asked friends, friends of friends, friends of friends of friends and colleagues, and we brought a whole bunch of people together that were experts in a very particular field. We had a mining professor, we had a space anthropologist there, we had roboticists there, a Martian meteorologist there, radiation experts there. All these people we got together for morning, they all did a little talk, and in the afternoon we hang up all our drawings, a bit like here on the wall here, and we had a design review. One thing not in the NASA Challenge remit was figuring out how to get the habitat to the red planet, which, as Xavier discovered, is a big influence on space design. That's quite problematic getting stuff to Mars. First of all, um, the tricky bit is, is getting it off Earth, in Earth orbit. We actually designed our Mars vehicles. So this, these are the two vehicles. This is our Mars transfer vehicle. MTV. So it's like a long sort of rocket train. It's a bit like that, yeah. So what actually goes to Mars, what you need to get to Mars, is this bit. So that's your cargo. All that will be fuel, and there's the engine, right? The rocket engine that brings you to Mars. Now, of course, you can't launch that in one go. What you need to do is you need to launch the cargo, fuel, 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 and the rocket engine. So all that gets into orbit, bit by bit, and gets assembled in orbit. So these things are assembled in orbit, Earth orbit, could be too heavy to get it up, yeah. right? But all of them are done by a separate rocket. So these are all the rocket launches that you need, then bring it all together in space, and then you're off to Mars. The mission design was devised by Professor David Cullen, who's a professor of astrobiology and space biotechnology. He and his students crunch their way through masses of existing data. The mission design certainly should be able to work. Um, we're looking to implement it realistically. If it is implemented, it's going to be in about 20 years' time. So therefore, from the technology point of view, uh, to some extent, we need to predict what technology will be available. Uh, from a space systems point of view, it is still relatively close to the future, so it's still primarily based upon technology we have now. But if I look at it critically, perhaps the main reason why, or the biggest risk to it not being implemented, is simply the cost. It is going to be expensive, and therefore the ultimate question is whether society is willing to invest the resources. But enough about cost. For a moment, let your mind wander and imagine what it might be like to live in a Mars habitat. So we're here in the Design Museum, Moving to Mars exhibition, and they've asked us specifically for this exhibition to take one-sixth of our habitat and build a one-to-one -one analog that visitors can walk in and experience how it would be to live on Mars. Wow, so this is, this is it, this is full yeah, size. Absolutely. Can you show me around? Let's go on in. Ooh, there we go. This is lovely and cosy. Actually, it's got a real sort of Japanese feel to <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> um, well, that's maybe because we used um, the flooring, as you see, is bamboo. Oh. And you might think, well, why are you bring all bamboo to yeah. Mars? Well, we're not. We're actually thinking of growing bamboo on Mars. 
right? So we're not going to grow plants to feed ourselves, mm. because for that you need masses of space, but maybe we can grow bamboo to build stuff mm. or to create finishes. And now you were talking about space saving before. This is not space saving, this is an <laughs> enormous piece of furniture. Yeah, I know, light and compact. That's not light <laughs> and compact, right? But you know what, we're not going to bring this to Mars. Mm. We're going to print it on Mars. Reason is because our astronauts on Mars, they will have lots of waste material from packaging, from food, from size experiments. So why not use that, recycle it, and print stuff out of it. For example, your furniture. Wow, that's the, a lot of food packaging. Well, <laughs> the, lot, the more they eat, the more they size, the more furniture they can get. Hooray, right? another reason to eat. That's yeah. brilliant. Okay, and look, you've got a lovely view here as well. Yeah. Even though we're sort of looking at a, a desert, this actually, because we're looking sort of at the other pods, it sort of makes it feel a little yeah, bit more exactly. sort of community. Well, you're looking really at is a courtyard. The courtyard is there for a very important reason, because we'll get indirect light in, you get some light from Mars, but you don't get direct sunlight in. You see, the sunlight doesn't really hit us. Mm. And that's important, because on Mars, direct sunlight means gamma radiation and is deadly. But we still want to have that view out, see somebody else in another pod. So obviously, you know, limited with space, yeah. so you had to be clever. Absolutely. We have this idea of a radial racking system mm -hmm. where it can be anything. It can be a kitchen, but it can also be a wardrobe, it can be a workshop or a lab. And the way to save space is that we, they are movable. So they're movable racks and suddenly we open up our lab space. So do some geology, Martian geology, yeah, yeah. or um, you know, use the workshop. We've got a 3D printer here. And once we're done with that, then I go out and when I want to use my wardrobe, oh. I just kind of open this up so again. So work's finished, done for the day. And there we go. I get my clothes. Get your clothes so, out yeah. and then a bit, of, a bit of cooking. So we can use so much more space and so much more usability out of this pod by doing this. So what's your favorite part of this design? For me, design? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's really sitting in this big sofa and just <laughs> looking at the rest of the Martian landscape. It's a beautiful sight. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and hit the bell button below for notifications. We'll see you next time.